research. That is, research which actually had implications for the development of the economy. And when he said in 1992 during his campaign to his staff and to the country, it's the economy, stupid, he took the economic imperative and placed it squarely at the center of science policy. And if you look at the history of science policy under Clinton and under Bush, you will discover that, in fact, the development of private industry as well as the development of products that could be used in the medical industry was given priority to anything that even had to do with what is called pure, pure research. The second part of my talk is very closely related to that. And it's got two parts. The first part, I have to start by telling you a story. It is a personal story, but it is a story that, and it's, it's the first time I've really told it publicly. My wife, who was a professor of journalism at New York University, fairly prominent journalist, her name is Ellen Willis, died of cancer in November of 2006. After having gone through 22 months, it was lung cancer, 22 months of incredible fight to save her own life and under the treatment from the NYU Oncology Center which is closely connected to Sloan Kettering. And the person who was her primary oncologist administered three treatments. One was chemotherapy, needless to say. The other was radiation. Oh, and also she had surgery to remove one of the tumors, in fact, the only tumor that was found on, on her lung, but it had spread, metastasized very briefly after that to, uh, to, to her lymph nodes. And the third one was, was experimental drugs. And as I told a few people, but I'll tell everybody, in the course of taking her to the clinic and talking to her and talking to her oncologist, I pointed out to him something that did not come literally as a surprise, not as a surprise, but in some sense as a shock. When I claimed and asked him to comment on, and by the way, this is not a small potatoes guy, this is a major international guy, because she had the best, I mean, the best that medical science c can offer. Not medical research necessarily, you know, but medical science. I claimed that there were three things that affect most diseases, major diseases, life-threatening diseases, but including cancer. She, got, she died at the age of 64, and she was not old by current standards. The first, of course, is genetic predisposition. One cannot deny the genetic predisposition to cancer. Her mother did, deny, did die of cancer at the age of 91. So there was some genetic predisposition, maybe. The second, which is the hardest to deal with at the level of treatment, is the physical environment that has been produced by the industrializing era of world capitalism that begins somewhere in the 18th century, but has matured in the 20th century so that all these things you know about, global warming, pollution, unsafe food, air, which is, you know, seriously flawed, And, of course, um, everything else you know, that we live in cars, we don't have a decent mass transit system, we don't really pay very much attention. I saw in the newspaper the other day 
Maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't, because it was on the back pages of the New York Times. You know how the back pages of the New York Times, that's where the real news is. You don't look at the front page, the front page you sort of glance at, but then you look in the, in the, in the details. They just appointed a very fine person who was New York Commissioner of Environmental, of, of uh, Food Safety, to be the head of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. She's responsible for the quality of food. Obama did a good thing. He did a bad thing with the agriculture uh, secretary, by the way, who was uh, who's owned lock, stock, and barrel by Archer Daniels Midland and Monsanto. He's, this, he's the secretary from Monsanto. He believes in genetically modified organisms are perfectly good. Never even questioning the, the problem of that. His education secretary, I, I don't want to say bad words on, on, uh, on television, but his Food and Drug Administration secretary was fine. And then in the fine print in the story, the fine print, it says, of course we don't have enough money, we don't have enough people to do inspections. So there are, there are 15,000 food processors in the United States, plants. We can't inspect them all, and we don't have enough workers. And you know, she was complaining, which was very good. So that's a that's the kind of issue that is part of the problem of science, of the relation of science and scientific research to policy. Because if you hold a pure genetic determination of of major diseases, especially of heart disease and of, and of cancer, the two, two of the largest killers then none of what I'm about to, I've been saying would mean anything to you. You would say, that's crap. But if you understand that the scientific attempt to create treatment regimes on the basis of chemical and biological solutions is only part successful to the degree that there is a complex of approaches to treatment, that includes the environment, that would have to make critiques of the industrial effects of automobiles and so on, then we have a different story. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But the third one is even more controversial than the second one. Although many people now are ready to say, look, there is a relationship maybe between cancer and the environment. The third one is, somebody said to me very, I thought very um, colloquially, stress. It's not stress. I mean, stress is itself a symptom. And here I plea expertise. And the reason I plea expertise is because one of the things that I study, I know that, I don't know what you've read of mine that brought me here, but you know, one of the things I study is, is the whole question of culture and the way we live now in everyday life. I've written about this quite extensively. And the studies that I have made demonstrates that the way people live, the, the pace of work, the pace of life, the pressures of finances, the pressures of the speeding up of time, and the, and the spatio-temporal dimension of everyday life especially is the, is the one that produces that kind of stress, can have enormous influence on people, on people's health, which may or may not manifest itself in disease. It may or may not manifest itself in fatigue. And it has a lot of different uh, uh, possibilities. But in truth, those are the three things. So, so what, can, what can scientists do about those three things in relationship to disease? I'm going to get to a second point in a minute. Hold that for a minute, because I want to get to the second point about the politics of science. I've had a congenital injury at birth on my hips and my feet for all of my life. Birth, by definition, is all of my life. I just remembered that. And throughout, throughout my life, I've gone through, um, you see I'm standing, uh, they said when I was, uh, they told my mother when I was very, very young that he would be in, if your, if your son lives to be 45, he'll be in a wheelchair. I'm not in a wheelchair, as you can see. 
And one of the things that my mother did, she's a real smarty. She's 95 now, and she doesn't have any interest, but she is smart. Is that she decided that instead of going, subjecting me to surgery, which was the, what, what the primary physician had actually suggested, she would take me to what is now called the Rusk Institute, which at that point was called the New York Orthopedic, and three days a week, from the time I was 18 months, when I started to, to, to stand up and try to walk, I only could walk on my toes. And she took me to, to, to New York Orthopedic, which gave physical and occupational therapy from the age of 18 months to the age of four years old for three days a week. She, I use the word drag because I often protested, do I have to go, do you? Yes, you have to go. She took me to occupational and physical therapy, whirlpool treatments, exercises, a whole alterna alternative to acute care, which was the basis of the a doctor's recommendation, which was surgery. Now, that is a prelude to asking the questions having to do with Chinese medicine, asking the questions having to do with chiropractic in certain, in certain, certain issues, you know, health issues. Asking the question about the relationship between what might be called the dominant paradigm of medical treatment to alternative paradigms of medical treatment. For years and years and years, for decades, the medical establishment was, in this country, was militantly opposed to the credentialing and the recognition of any alternative treatments at all. I still take occasionally acupuncture, and I take acupuncture because my, my foot never gives me rest, never gives me peace. And I cannot get insurance for the acupuncture. In other words, the insurance won't pay, so I have to put it out, take it out of my own pocket. The, the, the point of the story is not to talk about specific treatment regimes or to talk about the alternative medicine, but to ask the question, and ask you the question and ask everybody the question, is there one scientific paradigm? Is there one treatment regime? Is there one program of research that follows from the, the scientific paradigm that is eternally val valid? Or are there a plurality of both theoretical as well as practical conceptions that might be uh, uh, efficacious for the maintenance of people's health? I have to say this so that you understand. I have read books on the theory of Chinese medicine. I am by no means convinced that Chinese medicine has all the answers. I am certainly, after watching my, uh, my, my, my wife's uh, struggle with cancer, convinced that the models of cancer treatment, which are based on certain kinds of knowledge. I mean, you know, the cancer treatment is not simply a, a catch as catch can. It's grounded in a certain conception that you have to kill cells. I'm not totally convinced either. But is there, is there a point in the politics of science itself when the question of the monolith versus the plurality of possibilities can be discussed and debated openly and that it would be possible. I'm, and maybe it's true here. I, I'm not going to, uh, it wasn't true in, the, in, in NYU. That people who actually are experimenting are studying the consequences and the uses of acupuncture, which now has a cancer treatment, by the way. It's developing. It's a new one. I don't, not, I don't know much about it yet. That that could be validated by the federal government, by private corporations, by so on? You know, is it possible? Is it possible that the methodologies of experimental sciences from fundamental physics to 
bio, biochemistry, bio, biology, biomedical, that those fundamental paradigms, which are pretty much consistent between the, um, the spheres and natural science, can become objects of public and private debate. It, what it goes to is whether we think that science should be entirely autonomous or is entirely autonomous or whether science itself is, al is always already a public question that what it does should be subject to public scrutiny, which does not, and, and I can give you one more example, which is in some ways very mixed. When the AIDS epidemic began to appear in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration established test requirements and treatment regimes which were, which, which were upon which were conditioned the possibilities of funding for AIDS research. The, the application of AIDS treatments had to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration because they had all the money. And they were making all the decisions in connection with scientific par panels, peer-reviewed panels of the various forms of research. Then a scandal broke out in the United States. The 80s, beginning of the epidemic. That scandal was the following. A group called ACT UP, which consisted of primarily AIDS victims and their supporters began to ask for participation in the decisions which affected their lives. It was a political question to a person, this is not literally true, obviously, but generally speaking, the scientific establishment in the field of AIDS research was terribly opposed to the intervention of the citizen group, even though it included a lot of, a lot of um, uh, AIDS victims. And the AIDS victims made the, de made the demand that the, that, the, that the trial intervals be shortened so that experimental drugs be released earlier which scientists were opposed to, and in many cases with good reason. But that wasn't their major problem. Their major problem was that they were seeing these outsiders coming in and trying to tell them what to do. Well, the, the long and the short of it is after a lot of protest and direct action, direct action meaning they occupied the FDA offices, they made a lot of noise and so on, the FDA and the scientists began to negotiate with a group of citizens who were directly affected by the AIDS ep epidemic. And that act of negotiations led to the altering of the, of the regimes, of the uh, treatment and the um, testing regimes. Raises an interesting question. The question is, if science wanted to in any way be be autonomous, should it make alliances with the government, with the private corporations, primarily or exclusively, or should it seek actively citizen support for things that it wanted to do that would not necessarily be in the interest of those corporations or even the federal government? I know that none of you are in a position to make the fight. That's not the point that I'm making. The point is that obviously, the crossroads, which is indicated by, and I'm back to where I started, indicated by Obama's address, whether science can be autonomous will depend on which political alliances it is able to make and with whom. As long as it continues to rely exclusively both on the governments, governments, state and local governments in the United States as well as federal governments, in most countries there's no, there's no state and local autonomy in that regard and with the co private corporations, then science becomes a tool of those corporations and of the government. It becomes, in some re fundamental respect, subordinate. If science had its own program, and science had its own 
debates about questions of theory as well as questions of application as well as questions of health and what the social logic of health actually is, then it would by necessity have to do something serious about extending its influence and its discussion with people beyond these two sources. I'm going to conclude by raising a question that somebody in an email raised with me from your group. She's not here. It is no accident that beginning in the early 1980s when the Committee of Intern and Re Interns and Residents, CIR, was 1970s, late 70s and early 80s, the Committee of Intern and Residents was formed. It is a union of interns and residents which began in New York City now as a national organization. It's organized in San Francisco, by the way. They have a contract with the some of the hospitals in San Francisco as well as in New York, Los Angeles and San Francisco and a few other cities. What interns and residents began to understand in that period, that is the late 70s and early 80s, and have forgotten, is that one of the major problems is not only that they worked themselves to death, and they've changed that to some extent. They now only work, I know it's going to sound funny, they now have gotten the, the, the contractual work week down to 70 hours. And I've pointed out to uh, some of the activists in the Interns and Residents Union, I said, you know what? You're now at the level of cab drivers. They say, you don't understand, Stanley. We used to work 85 and 90 hours a week. So that's one of the demands. But the second problem they began to address and have forgotten is what about their relationship to regimes of patient care? What about their relationship to the use of, of, the, of the products of, um, of experimental as well as of uh, normal science? They began to ask these very qualitative questions about the quality of their own working lives beyond hours and wages, and they forgot it. So what I hope you will do if you decide to form a union of postdocs and be the first union of postdocs that you, you know, get a contract is that at some point you will consider, and you may reject, some of the questions that I have just raised. Thank you very much. That's about right. Thank you, Stanley. This was a really great talk. Are there questions? Uh, I hope so. Are there any questions? Uh, well, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Yes. That's a very good question. The pharmaceutical companies, the food processing companies, as the mili th those companies involved in military research have been for a long time in the fields of physics and chemistry, are together with financial corporations connected to them the main sources of income for the campaigns of the Democratic and Republican Party. I don't know whether that's a, a piece of news for you. The Democratic, we don't have public financing in this country of uh, presidential uh, campaigns or congressional campaigns, uh, or we do, but they always ignore those pu public uh, financing because they're not enough. So they get big bucks from those companies. And when Obama says, when President Obama says, I want the scientists to tell me what the policy of the federal government science policy should be, I am very skeptical of that statement because that would mean he would have to renounce most of his support. And it was not by accident that the Secretary of Agriculture was somebody who worked very closely with the Monsanto Corporation and Archer Daniel Midland Corporation and came out openly for genetic modified organisms, which in every place in Europe has regarded as a, as, as a no-no. It is because he has tacitly, to be sure, quite apart from his